My name is Melissa. I am the founder of Mount Movers Ministry, and I created this ministry to give you real truth, X-rated truth, not like what you see on Netflix and at the movies, extreme truth, because it's only extreme truth that has any power to set you free. So this is what we teach here. We teach out of God's word. That's the only word we teach out of. I don't like to go out and get a bunch of books from man and, and use a lot of references from man because there's not the anointing in man that there is in the word of God. So tonight the topic is forgiveness. Your life depends on it. And as, as I was saying earlier, if this was a call on debt cancellation, we would have 10 times more women to this call. And you know why? Because it's something we can get from God. But when we have the opportunity to give something to God, the numbers go down. If you were on our face, uh, our Instagram live on Monday, it's the story of the nine lepers, the 10 lepers. One leper received from the Lord and wanted to give his life back to the Lord. Nine lepers wanted something. What have you done for me lately, God? Hey, what do you have for me? What kind of blessings do you have? Nine lepers did not return back to even give thanks to the Lord for all of his favor and blessing and healing and deliverance on their lives. Can you believe it? Do you know that that's a lot of the church? That's a 90% ratio. Nine out of 10 lepers, because there was nothing in it for them. To go back and thank God and to give gratitude to God, see, it takes time to walk all the way back and to seek and find Jesus, and to say, hey, guess what? I want to thank you so much. See, our effort in our relationship with God takes time. Only one leper came back. I shared this on Monday. I'm not going to get into too much detail. Nine out of 10, that's 90% of Christians, because these ratios and percentages are important. When God gives you a, a story in the Bible with numbers, every number counts. That is nine out of 10 that got help from the Lord in their most dire of situation. And only one came back to give thanks and praise. Isn't that disheartening? See, when we want something from the Lord, right? That's when we're, we're surfing social media. Hey, I'm being attacked by demons. I'm sick. See, we, were, we want something. But when it's time for us to get into the wor word, and pray or even intercede on somebody's behalf, how tired do we become? How distracted do we become? How lifeless do we become? How many excuses do we make? How do we reason out of that situation to be the one leper? We wanna be that one leper that came back. So tonight, this is gonna be your opportunity to give something back to the Lord. And I know many of us think that this is just a, you know, let's move on to something more interesting. Let's talk about witchcraft. You know, let's talk about uh, false Holy Spirit. You know, show me some good stuff. Let's look at some pictures and some, you know, some of the sensationalized stuff online that gets a lot of clickbait and a lot of clicks. But I'm going to tell you something. The reason I decided on this topic is for several reasons. But the main reason I decided on it is because I sincerely believe in my heart of hearts that most people, to include most Christians, nine out of 10, like the lepers, different situation, but a huge majority of people believe in their heart that they have fully forgiven the person that has hurt or wronged them, and they are under a delusion. And because they have this delusion, this deceiving spirit, this lying spirit convincing them that they have fully forgiven, they stay in captivity. They stay in bondage. And then you know what they do? They go seek man. <laughs> Isn't this like a vicious cycle? So we go seek man and, we're, and we go to videos. Why am I sick? Why am I being tormented? And then you go see a multitude, a plethora of videos looking for symptom solution. You know, that's what we want to do. Let's take care of the symptoms, but let's not get to the root. And the reason I'm sharing this is because I'm going to be extremely vulnerable tonight because I'm going to share a little bit of my own personal story. And I'm going to show you a few pictures of me and well, one picture of me, but a couple of pictures of someone that I truly believe I forgave in my heart until the Lord told me I had not. 
and that is my father. And the reason I want to share this with you is because I had been a believer most during this entire duration of believing in my heart that I had forgiven my father until the Lord challenged me with something that forever changed my life. Now, mind you, this was years ago, but uh, this was in my serious walk with the Lord because in my unserious, lukewarm, 50 shades of gray walk with the Lord, I believed that I had forgiven my dad and that I was entitled to treat him the way I was treating him. I, it was my own way of getting back without realizing that getting back was actually full blatant sin before the Lord. And I don't mean getting back, obviously. It wasn't murder. It wasn't, you know, this, this um, more severe type of the way that you would think, right? This wasn't like anything like that. But it was some things I did that I'm going to share with you tonight. And I had to even make restitution for them. See? All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so we're going to get started from the beginning. If you're new to Mount Movers, go ahead and say hello to us in the chat. And if you're watching by YouTube and this, uh, this teaching is blessing you, I'm going to ask you to stay to the end. We're going to divide this teaching into two parts only for one reason. Tonight, if you are fortunate enough to be here, we're going to go through an exercise on forgiveness. Because no use talking without doing. God is tired of this. But, 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 but. He wants us to be doers of the word. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the teaching. And if you would like to go through the exercise, it's not, it shouldn't even be called an exercise, but I have to call it something. If you want to go through full forgiveness, seeing some areas and some blind spots that, uh, that the Lord is going to reveal to you tonight, then after this teaching, I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to end. And then I'm going to uh, start a second part to this. And this is going to be the exercise on forgiveness. I truly believe, I truly believe with everything that I know, um, everything that God has revealed and because of who Jesus Christ is and how he started his ministry for God so loved the world <laughs> that he gave his only life by forgiving he gave by forgiving. So I know beyond anything that I've ever known that no demon, no sickness, no torment, no stronghold will bow until we understand this in our heart to the level that there is a godly, sorrowful repentance before the Lord for carrying on uh, with the sin of unforgiveness. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to be sharing, in addition to details of my own personal life, I'm going to be sharing with you two thought processes on the topic of forgiveness, the world's and God's. I'm going to share with you Google and then God. <laughs> and then we get to decide if we're going to walk the narrow road with God or if we're going to veer off a little bit, right? Veer off a little bit because we have a hardness of heart tonight because we might be stubborn, see? There's a, a spirit that will blind us literally from truth. That spirit will put us into self-pity and will want us to make every excuse uh, in the demonic kingdom regarding why it is so difficult to forgive. But we are gonna crush that tonight in the name of Jesus. So forgiveness, your life depends on it. First of all, we have to understand that your physical life here on earth to include the quality and success of your life depend on full forgiveness. In fact, I'm going to put that word in front, full forgiveness, not our idea or concept of forgiveness, but biblical, pure, holy and full forgiveness. I have to work on this all the time. See, I have to make sure that I'm in alignment on the narrow road of how God commands me as his daughter regarding forgiveness. See, I'm a teacher of the word and I'm accountable to the Lord for my own walk and for what I share. If I'm not walking the talk, <laughs> I am a counterfeit hypocrite. So I'm telling you that I've had to deal with the Lord. I've had to be rebuked and corrected 
and course corrected. And we will, that's part of our walk that no one talks about. No one talks about the discipline of the Lord, the correction of the Lord, the rebuke of the Lord. Well, guess what? It says God chastens those he loves. If we are not being disciplined, course corrected and navigated onto the narrow road continually, then we are not sons and daughters of God because our father is going to discipline his children. He's not going to discipline other children. You don't go discipline your uh, sister's children or your neighbor's children, right? Because they're not your children. So if you see them acting crazy, acting wild, you're not going to say anything, right? You're not going to say you can't because they're not your children. So you will step out because uh, you do not have permission. When you are God's child, the humble and contrite heart we should have is, Lord, keep me in the center of your perfect will. Let's pray that. And the Lord will say, are you sure? Because let me tell you what it's going to cost. <laughs> we pray things like this. Heal me, you know, fix my marriage. How about this? Lord, keep me in the center of your perfect will. And God will say, all right, then it's time to correct and rebuke and discipline you if, in fact, you are sincere about wanting to be in my will. See, that's a good godly prayer that God will answer. All hands on deck on that, uh, that prayer, okay? So your physical here, life here on earth and the success the success and quality of your life will depend on forgiveness and your spiritual life to include where you spend eternity will depend on full forgiveness according to God's word, not according to Google. So the reason I'm doing it, like I said, is the delusion, the, the delusion. Okay, let's begin. Uh, let's see. I took a bunch of notes. I'm going to be reading because this is going to be a really hearty, hearty call. And this is why we record them. That way you can go back and listen. I'm going to tell you that let your heart be open, your spiritual ears be open, and your spiritual eyes be open. Because if you allow God, if you, if you take off every boundary and every wall, you take down every wall and you allow the spirit of God to speak to you tonight, this can bring, bring tremendous freedom and healing into your life immediately. You know how we like instant gratification? You know how we like Botox? You know, that instant gratification, see what I'm saying? This is the key. This is the, the entire key that opens up every single blessing, every single provision, and the entirety of God's protection in your life. If you are not in full forgiveness, the enemy will have an inroad into every area of your life. And guess what? It's not just your life when you're walking in unforgiveness. It's in the house. See, your attitude is in the house. Your heart is the one raising those kids. See? See, there's a collateral, there's a multifaceted damage that happens from unforgiveness. Don't just think it's a personal decision that you get to make when you feel like it. Unforgiveness will impact your children. I'm going to show you. It's going to impact your marriage, your health, your finances, and just about everything else you can count on. So if someone were to say to me, I want, Melissa, if there were one key concept in the Bible that would help me to be delivered and healed from a smorgasbord of spiritual attacks and everything in between, what would it be? And I'd say, start at the very basics like Jesus did. And let's go back to the topic of unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is a spiritual law that God has established, not just for you and I as believers, but for unbelievers as well, because it is a spiritual law. It's not a natural law like gravity. A spiritual law means that everybody, unbeliever, believer, is held is held to be responsible for the spiritual laws that God has created. Here's another spiritual law that either unbeliever or believers are accountable and responsible to know, that life and death is in the power of the tongue. You know who knows that well? Witches. They understand that spirit, spiritual law. 
That's why they hex and vex and do incantations and can curse you because they understand that spiritual law. Christians don't. That's why we fall under witchcraft. But let me tell you something. Pagans, saint worshipers, and just about everybody else understands the spiritual laws at hand. And if we do not understand these spiritual laws, you can go through deliverance. You can do whatever you think you want to do. And uh, whoever knows that spiritual law best will have the most power. Remember, just because you're a believer, see, just because we're believers doesn't mean we walk in power. The Bible says we have power and authority, but we don't have the ability to use it, to be protected by it, and to wield our sword that is going to intimidate the enemy so that we can resist him and he will flee. So let me tell you, you know who else understands uh, these spiritual laws? People who manifest into the universe. You know, what's really sad is that Wicca and witchcraft is becoming the fastest growing spiritual movement in the world. I'm going to be doing my next teaching next week on that, you know, and I, I'm going to tell you why, because I actually met a black witch. I met her at the farmer's market, sent Carla in the video, and she had some very interesting things to share. And she's a black witch, not a white witch. Better be careful when you're talking to a black witch. Because their monitoring spirits know exactly what you're doing. They are reading the situation. See, I don't recommend that for everybody, but it worked out well. And we're going to be talking about it next week. Because I want to know why witchcraft is so, uh, why everybody's so interested in it. Don't you? I want to know why it's beating the, the amount of people that are coming to the Lord is being overtaken by that. Don't you want to know why? Don't you want to know why your daughter is attracted to witchcraft? Don't you know why our kids are on their phones all day? Don't you know why we have a hard time getting our kids to stop playing video games? Don't you know why we're having all of these issues? Because witchcraft is a ruling spirit and it's gaining a lot of power. But back to my, my topic, I share this with you because witches, witches know spiritual laws. New agers know how to manifest more so than we do. And what becomes the issue is when it's there's mixed uh, some Christianity and a little bit of this, right? Because Christians can operate in manifestation through divination, etc., through new age, uh, through new age doctrine, right? Through Gnostic mystical stuff. But Christians can op also operate in witchcraft. See, the narrow road uh, separates you and sets you apart so that you are pure, you are uncontaminated. So this is why Mount Movers is here, to help you see the mixture, to help you see a little bit of that contamination in your soul and in your flesh so we can get that out and keep you on the narrow road so that we end up getting uh, what, what we uh, are entitled to because of Jesus Christ. But even more importantly, we can present that crown before the Lord. All right, so let me show you what the world says because we always have to go to the world. You know, we're in the world, we're not of the world. So we have to understand what they are saying in regards to forgiveness. Now, all they're doing, I'm not impressed. All they're doing is they're catching up with the Bible. So I'm not impressed, all right? But we're gonna look at this real quickly. This is another article I was gonna... Uh, I want to show you this real quickly. So let's see if you can see that. All right. The power of forgiveness. The reach method teaches how to overcome lingering bad feelings. Whatever this reach method is, I'm not interested. I'm just going to tell you right now. But see, here's the issue. Most of us want to go here to find solutions instead of going to the word of God. This is our competition, ladies. This is competing for your life your livelihood, your sanctification. This is competing for your kids and their success, staying out of woke culture, not being uh, uh, seduced and deceived. See, this is our competition, but you know what? More people go to Google every single day than read the word of God. Did you know that? I bet you I could pull up a statistics on how many people go here versus turning pages in their Bible. I bet you we'd be astounded. In fact, I'm going to put that on a little post-it note to go check that out. So the REACH method, letting go. This teaches you, this is Harvard uh, This is Harvard Medical School. I'll be honest with you, I'm not interested in Harvard. I could just go to their logo right here and I could have a heyday with this logo. 
Look at this lion right here. Why would I listen to a lion? <laughs> Unless it's the lion from the tribe of Judah, but that's Old Testament. Anyway, see, these are the experts. These are the gurus. These are the people we respect and the world experts that we put our trust into. So we're going to go do what they say to do. But none of this is God. So none of this is going to be pure. So no, none of this is going to be holy in the sight of God. But now we can go to John Hopkins. John Hopkins says, forgiveness, your health depends on it. I said, your life depends on it. I kind of stole what they said, but I, I X'd out health and I put your life. So here we go. They tell you all about what forgiveness does. And they tell you how to overcome forgiveness. They tell you reflect and remember, empathize. I like the forgive deeply, but we're not, that's not from the word. Let go of expectations, forgive yourself. So there's some good stuff in here. All right. You know, come on. We're dealing with Ivy League schools. I went there when I was bedridden. You've heard my story. And guess what? Harvard couldn't help me. John Hopkins couldn't help me. Mayo Clinic couldn't help me. You know what the Bible says? That the word of God is health to all of your flesh and healing to all of your body. See, guys, ladies, these people don't know it all. They believe they're know-it-alls, but they do not know it all. Let's keep going. Three ways forgiveness is good for your health. So the, and I'm showing you this because this is what people are doing right now. You're on this live teaching and the world, the nine lepers that I spoke about earlier, the nine are on Google pulling up stuff like this that is going to send them to hell. You cannot manage unforgiveness. It's impossible. Forgiveness helps you manage stress. Well, what if I'm not under stress? I'm not going to forgive. See what I'm saying? There are so many errors in this, but a lot of this is true. They're giving you the, the medical and scientific reasons because we're all selfish. You know, hey, if this is going to help me lose weight, if this is going to help me look younger, if this is going to give me something, then maybe I'll consider forgiveness. But you know what? The parasympathetic nervous system, when you come in for deliverance, this is one of the things that we work on. All right, you can keep going, but you know what they say? Go do yoga. <laughs> Forgiveness helps you uh, ruminate less, which can help you lower your risk of psychological disorders. They're correct. I'm telling you, I have nothing to say about these articles, but they're because they're correct, but they're only half truths. And because they're half truths, they're not real truth. Remember, Herod, what is truth? Well, it's not this. This is half truth, but this is not the entire truth because the entire truth is found in the Bible because Jesus said, I am the way, not Google. I am the way, not Harvard. I am the way, I am the truth, not Mayo Clinic, and I am the life. So we cannot have competing voices on serious topics that have the ability and they have the uh, legal ground to send us to an eternity separated from God and thinking that we're a Christian is not going to be enough <laughs> when we stand before the Lord with unforgiveness in our heart. I liked this article from LinkedIn, World Forgiveness Day. Have we really come this far, ladies? Are we, you know what? We're more in the end days with this kind of stuff than we are if I were to see, uh, you know, the red calf <laughs> or the red cow or one of those prophecies coming to pass. We literally have to have a World Forgiveness Day. Isn't this just absolutely ridiculous? So what do you do the other 364 days? That's what I want to ask the author of this article. What do you do? So you do this one day and then what? But you know what? Here, they're all saying the same thing. Lower blood, pressure, lower blood pressure, stress reduction, less hostility, better anger management skills. See? Look, and all of this is true. Unclean spirits come in from unforgiveness. All spirits come in from unforgiveness. All spirits come in from unforgiveness. Fewer anxiety symptoms, reduction in chronic pain, healthier relationships, traumas, childhood, block tree creativity, reflect, let go. This is some of the same stuff. So he just took this stuff from the other stuff, but let's keep going. Forgiveness is a journey, not a destination. How ridiculous is that? 
All right. So I'm going to stop there for a second because I, I just get so angry with this because this is just so positively ridiculous because it's really going to keep us uh, in captivity. The Bible says my people are in captivity because they lack my knowledge. They have plenty of Google knowledge. They have plenty of knowledge from social media. They have plenty of knowledge from all the books that they read, but they lack my knowledge. See, God's knowledge is undiluted. It is pure and it is perfect. See? So we have to be careful whose knowledge we are getting. This is our ear gate, our eye gate, the spirit of self-control that won't send us there before we go to God. We want all of these people to teach us these things instead of going to the teacher of all things. God is the teacher of all things pertaining to life and godliness. So what I'm going to tell you is anything you are interested in, go to your teacher first. Go to God first. This is how you develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit. So part two, I don't have time tonight, but briefly we're going to discuss the biblical consequences uh, in addition to all those other consequences, health, lymphatic system, uh, immune response. So that should get us pretty excited enough to consider staying through this teaching all the way to the end of the exercise. When women come in for the mentorship program, this is one of the first things we talk about. Now I don't go straight for the juggler. See, that should be easy. We should have already done that. I'm assuming that many of us have already done this, but then I realized that I hadn't done it when I started teaching the word. Can you believe that? Years and years and years ago. But here's what it was. My heart was there, but the enemy was convincing me I'd fully forgiven. See? So there's nothing wrong with it. I'm saying we all fall into these little traps, and this is why we're supposed to stay in the word. So uh, what we're going to share are some spiritual consequences to unforgiveness. Now, understand this. These are uh, spiritual consequences for unbelievers and believers alike. This means that whether you, you believe in God, you are lukewarm for the Lord, or whether you are you know, just getting started in your walk with the Lord, the consequences start immediately. In fact, the consequences started even before you became born again. We heaped up a bunch of demonic consequences from the type of sin, the quality of the sin and the quantity of the, of the sin that we committed. We heaped for ourselves a lot of things that need healing and deliverance. How many years? I'm 58. However old you are, you have 40 years, 30 years, you know, 25 years. So consider that for a second. Because it's amazing when you see that God took that bag off of our shoulder, all of that baggage, all of those consequences, all of that stuff. He took it from, from us and he put it on his back. Can you imagine baggage on every single person, 6 billion people times 6,000 years? And he put it on his back for you and I. So we're going to talk about the biblical consequences. And these are even more severe. I'd rather deal with stress. Okay. To me, that's that's a little bit easier of a consequence to deal with. But how about soul ties? When you are in unforgiveness with your mother or you see, you can form soul ties with anybody. Anybody that you have been in a relationship with, you can form a soul tie in business. Not with the actual business, but with people in business. You can form a soul tie with people at church. You can form a soul tie with people you've uh, fornicated with. You can uh, have a soul tie with uh, your kids, just about anybody. You can have a soul tie with your pastor. I didn't say sexual soul tie. That's one type. That's one type. I said soul tie. Unforgiveness keeps soul ties intact. So what we do is we go to Google and we say, I need to break soul ties. So we go to YouTube and we type in soul ties and we're like, yeah, this sounds good. I like the, the slide, you know, it looks cool. It captivated me, see? And we go listen to that teaching and the devil knows we have no clue, see? Cause it's not just about breaking soul ties. What gave them legal right? And unforgiveness towards somebody keeps that soul tie intact. And every demon affiliated with that, with that relationship gets to torment you after you're born again. See, because of the spiritual laws, 
leaving and resulting in spiritual consequences. So what I want you to think about, and we're going to get to that exercise at the end, are relationships. All relationships have the ability to form an ungodly soul tie. And all your relationships also have an opportunity to, for, to result in godly soul ties. Carlin and I, the anointed teacher that you hear on our, on our ministry, president of the ministry, we have a godly soul tie. We're knit together. We're of one spirit. We're of one mind. We're of one accord. Did I say that we never have these little things where we'll go back and forth? A hundred percent. See? But we're knit in spirit, meaning she and I are together uh, in, in regards to what we want this ministry to do, but also in our individual relationships with the Lord. You are going to have the strongest and most godly soul ties with women that are of one accord in the true faith of Jesus Christ. See? I've had ungodly soul ties with so-called Christian women. And it wasn't their fault. I'm not blame shifting. I needed lots of deliverance and healing. See? So I'm not here to, uh, I, I, I want to give you the full spectrum so that we're well balanced, but you can have godly soul ties, even with your mom and dad. I used to have an ungodly soul tie with my mom. We now have a, a godly soul tie. And it's not even a soul tie because, you know, when I, when you leave and get married, you don't really have that soul tie, but I mean a soul connection, a relationship where two people can get along and love one another and respect one another, no matter what, uh, you know, the enemy tries to bring uh, against that relationship. So just remember that soul ties are real and without, unforg without forgiveness, I don't care how many teachings you listen to, you will never break that soul tie. So when we have soul ties, guess what happens? We have sexual dreams. A lot of us have sexual dreams, so we'll go look for a video on incubus and succubus, right? But the enemy will never let us get to the root of anything. So what, what do we do? We go to Google, we go to social media, we go to YouTube, we type in all of these teachings because we're, what does it say in Timothy? That women, heavy laden by their sin, always learning but never coming to the knowledge of true, truth. We're always wanting to learn, but we don't want to come to the knowledge of what God's truth says in regards to forgiveness. Forgiveness is Christianity 101. And I know when we talk about this topic, many of us might say, well, I truly believe I have forgiven every person. We're going to see when we go through this exercise together and you will come to the Lord. And if that is true, I'm going to tell you something. You are going to be easy breezy for the Lord to heal and deliver. You are. I, your road and your journey will be much quicker, which is amazing. All right. So spiritual consequences, soul ties, sexual dreams can be a result of soul ties where there is not forgiveness. Okay. Uh, curses. Curses would, would be something like this, uh, not completely and fully forgiving your mom and dad. That's the number one curse. That's the number one curse against God. Now, of course, forgiveness again, unforgiveness towards God, that's a whole other level. There's a lot of people who have a lot of unforgiveness towards God. You know who the main person is? The devil. That's why he rebelled. See, the devil was holding on to Ot. Lucifer was holding on to Ot. He had a whole bunch of other issues in heaven before he was cast down. Because demons need to be cast out and cast down. Jesus casted out Satan from heaven. And he's going to cast them into the lake of fire. So let's make no mistake. Demons need to be cast out. You cannot heal a demon. So Lucifer, same thing. See, same thing had unforgiveness. So all that ought and that hurt and everything else, supposedly he was feeling, however they feel it at that level. Turned on God because that's what you do when you have unforgiveness. He held a grudge against God. He turned on God. He was hurt with God. <laughs> you know, a whole, a whole smorgasbord, like I said earlier. So there you go. So look what forgiveness does at the ultimate, on at the ultimate dark side. So uh, 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 curses are a result of not forgiving, but the most serious one for you and I is unforgiveness towards mom and dad. In Ephesians, it says, honor your mother and your father so that it may go well for you and so that you may live a long life. 
That was one of the commandments, honor your father and mother. You know how important that commandment was? He brought it in to the New Testament for you and I today. <laughs> you know, Jesus fulfilled the law and the commandments, but he still has given us the requirement, the requirement, okay, to make sure that we are meeting the conditions so that these curses don't follow our life. When I did not fully forgive my mom and dad at varying points in my relationship with them, I was under financial curses continually. Nothing in my life ever went right. Nothing. Financially. Now that's just one. That's just one type of consequence that I personally experienced. There was another time in my life in my serious walk with the Lord where the enemy was using my mom and I to antagonize one another. And I started getting breast pain. Unbeknownst to me, I didn't know that a lot of breast cancer and breast pain come and can come and be a result of unforgiveness with your mother or your father. See, these are the spiritual laws that we have to understand so that we do not have to suffer the consequences. If someone were to come to me and say, Melissa, I have this type of sickness, one of the first things we would want to do is make sure that their heart is in the right place to receive healing. There is a delusion in deliverance because if I were to take that out to anybody else, to, to a pastor or a teacher or a false prophet operating in Kundalini, what they always like to do is say, well, Jesus didn't do that. He didn't ask them to forgive anybody. He just healed them and casted out demons. And see, that's why the church is sick and infected because we don't understand the entire truth. We get one little truth and make it the entire truth. We don't get the entire truth. See, mature Christianity doesn't want it easy. Mature Christianity wants to live under the perfect will of God. So mature Christianity seeks the deep things of the Lord. It doesn't expect these cute little, quick little things just because they read it in the gospel, because sometimes you can read the Bible and it's more dangerous than it is helpful because a familiar spirit will get you to believe that everything's just easy. And if Jesus did it this way, then you can do it this way. But what they don't tell you and the devil doesn't tell you is that Jesus was sinless. Jesus was perfect. Jesus didn't have any ought. Jesus didn't have any soul ties. Jesus didn't have any contamination. See, but we don't think about it like that. And then they get a scripture and say, well, the greater works, you're going to do the greater works of Jesus. And I laugh and say, what greater work can you do than dying on a cross for the entire sin of mankind? Show me your greater work. Sure, I know. I know people personally that raise people from the dead. I get that. That's a great work. But I don't know anybody except Jesus Christ who has taken the entirety of the sin of mankind on his back, died for that sin, went to hell and fought the enemy to take the keys back. He didn't even fight the enemy, pardon me. He went and took the keys back of death, Hades, and the grave. And now he's seated at the right hand of God. So these greater works, we have to be careful that it's not mixed with kundalini. That's what sends us doing all of the ridiculous things we're doing is because we know enough word to be dangerous to ourselves and not dangerous enough to the enemy. So curses, sexual dreams, disease, and unclean spirits can attach. Alcoholism, depression, cutting, fornication, murder, murder. The first murder case in the entire Bible, Cain and Abel. You know why? Because because Cain had some ought. We're going to talk about that towards God. In fact, God says, uh, he said to Cain, Cain, where is your brother Abel? And Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? You know why? Because he had unforgiveness towards Abel. He had jealousy towards his brother Abel. He had undealt with things that ended up costing him severely in the end. And you know what? Even then, God was gracious to him because God hadn't dealt with sin yet. Isn't that amazing? God was so gracious uh, to all of those people in the, the beginning of the Bible until the law came he, and until Noah's flood had come. He had forgotten. He hadn't dealt with sin yet. So 
Can you imagine? That's exactly what it does. It commits murder. That's what the devil did. That was the first sin in the Bible. And the devil has continued to kill, steal, and destroy. Let me tell you something. A friend of mine that I grew up with by the name of Donna, that's the only name I'm going to share. She was uh, hurt and abused mentally, mentally, never physically, mentally and emotionally by her husband. He would reject her, put her down, criticize her, the whole thing. Okay. Long story short. And I know, I know them well because she never got healed from those soul wounds and all of that rejection. He had significant narcissistic tendencies. Now, whenever I'm talking about narcissism, both are equal. Uh, both people are responsible. I don't pick on the narcissist without showing the person putting up with that, that they're equally at fault. That's a whole other teaching. I'm not going there. We always like to blame the narcissist instead of looking at ourselves for staying in the relationship with that type of person. See, there's two sides. There's two sides. This is how I forgave my dad because the enemy had me believing it was always my dad's fault. See, see how things get a little skewed. So anyway, my friend Donna ended up becoming a lesbian. She had no tendency to do that. Now, I don't know her history. I don't know if something had happened to her as a little girl, but her husband ended up divorcing her and she had so much hurt. Now, this was a beautiful young woman. When my daughter Ashley and her dad and I would get together, we would get together with this couple. We did everything with this couple. They were at the house. They, they had four beautiful children, beautiful children. They had a great life. He was very, very, very successful in the car industry. They lived in a beautiful home. She looked beautiful all the time, very naturally pretty. I used to admire her and we were really good friends and we hung out a lot of time in our old shenanigan days. <laughs> you know, we'd hang out at the happy hours and all that kind of stuff. And she was Catholic and I was, uh, I was Christian, but you know, Catholic, you know, mixture at the time. So anyway, when she, when he divorced her because she had so much, she needed so much healing and deliverance. It wasn't that she didn't forgive him, but because she felt so much rejection which is a symptom of unforgiveness. Rejection is a symptom of unforgiveness. Can you have rejection as a little kid that has nothing to do with, with unforgiveness? 100%. I'm talking in adulthood. I'm talking in this example, in this case study. But because she dealt with so much criticism and re rejection and everything else, it skewed her and it tainted her from men because she had unresolved things that she did not take to the Lord. And because of that, she lost trust in men and she ended up dating and then marrying a woman. Now, I didn't know this. I left, moved to Chicago, came back to Albuquerque, New Mexico, saw her one day at a Dollar Tree. Isn't that great where I shop? I'm giving you all my, my secrets. <laughs> I used to be the Nordstrom's girl, now I'm the Dollar Tree. Anyway, so I'm at the Dollar Tree and I see her and I just go up to her and she's a lesbian. I mean, you, you know what that looks like. So I don't have to go into the detail and my mouth dropped. But in that minute, the Lord had revealed to me that that was the reason. So that's an example of an unclean spirit. Did you know that one of the reasons that women become lesbian is because they have unforgiveness towards their mother or their father? And that unforgiveness came from rejection. But instead of dealing with the rejection, and it's not th their fault. This is not, this is not pulling punches and calling faults. I'm telling you why we have homosexuality. Why we have, we don't have homosexuality because, you know, of movies and music and all of that influence. We have homosexuality because we have fatherless homes. We have homosexuality because we have unnurturing mothers. We have homosexuality because we have two uh, uh, father and a mother trying to climb the corporate ladder, leaving their kids at the care uh, of somebody else. So if we were going to get to the root of homosexuality, it's not a gene. It's not this and that what the world tells you. We're not going to Google. We're going to God. If we were to trace why we have that spirit, 
It's it could be ancestral. I'm not saying every reason. If you are dealing with someone in your family who was going through this, especially a, a son or a daughter, I am not saying that you did not nurture. We have to be adults and we have to understand the premise of the way I'm sharing this. But we have to understand that on, uh, generationally, these things happen. And then when these kids grow up dysfunctionally, and here's what I mean dysfunctionally. Do you and I have to hit our kids with a belt, slap them around, lock them in the closet to be abusive? Or is there some type of spiritual abuse in the sense, in the sense that they were not raised adhering to the precepts of God? Well, that's what I had to repent to her for. Because I had to make restitution. See, when you want healing and freedom, it's the Lord's way, not my way. Uh, counterfeit spirits would never tell you to do some of the things that God requires. They want you to have all this stuff without doing anything in order to meet the conditions for it. And that's why so many people are leaving the narrow road to go this way. So I had to literally do this with my daughter. I had to ask for forgiveness for her because she was born in fornication I had to ask her for forgiveness. Now, what she said is, mom, you know what? Well, you don't have to do that. You know, you didn't know better. And But the Lord instructed me to do it. You know why? Because I needed her to see that why she had the eating disorder was not her fault. Do you know how many people blame themselves when they never had a chance to make it from the very start? Do you know that my daughter was illegitimate in the spirit realm? So I'm telling you the way the Lord has dealt with me. I haven't done that with every single person I haven't forgiven. I haven't gone to that level. This is why you need to hear from the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will give you every instruction. And he's not going to tell you to meditate and go to th a therapist and go to a psychologist to deal with unforgiveness. And he's certainly not going to tell you it's a journey. He is going to help you to understand why what happened happened so you can deal with it, so you can resolve it, so you can be delivered from it, and so that you can be healed from it. But without uh, full forgiveness, you are vulnerable and susceptible to every type of unclean spirit. The last spiritual consequence and the most important is our eternal life, fully and completely separated from God and the Holy Spirit. All right, now we're going to go on to this part. Why is forgiveness so difficult? Why do we have to have National Forgiveness Day? Why are there a thousand books written on forgiveness when we have the good book and the only book that tells us exactly how to do it? The reason forgiveness is difficult is because it, it requires the ultimate denial and death of self. That's what happened to Jesus. He had to deny himself and die to himself. And literally die, not die to self, die. That's why the, uh, forgiveness is difficult. Because it literally requires, it's the most selfless, selfless thing we can do. It is the most Jesus-like thing we can do. Forgiveness requires complete and total denial and death of self. That's why it's difficult. That's the only reason, actually, it's difficult. This is why it can only be done perfectly through the power of the Holy Spirit. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Anybody struggling with unforgiveness does not know the word of God. I didn't say read. I didn't say read the word of God. I said, know the word of God. There's a difference. So that is a good place to start. But we won't even have that time because I hate to say it. There are Christians that die every day that because they are in unforgiveness did not go to heaven and quote me on it and take me any word, take me to any pastor in church and quote me, tweet me, whatever you want to do. If we are in unforgiveness as a Christian, and we die in unforgiveness, according to God's word, we are not going into the eternity with our father. And see, a lot of people 
would say that's too extreme because it says that the way you receive salvation is if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart, then you're saved. I, you're correct. When I came to my salvation, that's all I did. I didn't close my doors. I didn't stop doing the new age. I didn't do any of that. That's the simplicity of the good news. So I got the good news. I appropriated the good news. I came to Jesus Christ and now Jesus opened my eyes and he says, okay, now it's time to get started so that you can mature in your faith and make it to the end. That's what Paul says. Paul says, make sure you make it to the end. Work out your own salvation with awe and reverence. Work it out. I'm not talking about, can you lose your salvation? I'm not going there. I want you to hear the main message on unforgiveness. Jesus gave us this gift by his perfect example of true forgiveness so that we could have grace and his love and his faithfulness to give us a VIP pass straight to heaven. But then he has expectations of us as his children. It's not that we're saved and there's no expectations, no conditions. See, that is what is destroying the church. There's a lot of misconceptions. A lot of the church doesn't believe that they're going to be in the tribulation. Post, pre, how about this? Perilous times are coming. Times that no man can bear, 2 Timothy 3, 1. But you know, we're teaching a great awakening. Everything's going to be peachy king. We're going to take over Hollywood and politics, and we're going to do all these great things because they're teaching, seducing doctrines of demons uh, that are being done by seducing spirits. That's what is happening. And that's why people are attracted to Kundalini. That's why they're attracted to New Age. That's why attracted to witchcraft, because they want to be in control of their own lives. When I manifest it, I want it done. See, they want to take control instead of allowing God to take control because he created us and he knows exactly what we are here for. So let me make this clear. If we are in any type of unforgiveness, and I don't want to make anybody nervous and say, oh my gosh, is Melissa going to give me 20 steps to full pure forgiveness? Absolutely not. You will know when you have fully forgiven a person because of the result. Jesus says you will know it by its fruit. Every good thing has fruit. You'll know when you're healed, when you're no longer sick. You'll know, you'll know when you're delivered, when you're no longer tormented. And you certainly will know when you are forgiven because there's fruit with that also. So every good and perfect thing from our father yields fruit right away. Some right away and some there's a harvest later on. So this is why it begins with understanding in the heart, not head knowledge. God's not interested in head knowledge. That's what the Jews had. They wore scripture on their forehead all the time. We have to have the heart knowledge of God's grace and forgiveness, forgiveness for us and towards us through his forgiveness of us in regards to the quantity and quality of our own sin, past, present, and future. That's a lot of sin. God has already forgiven me of all of my past. Everything I'm going to do or not do today that the enemy can pick on me for and everything that I'm going to do in the future because I'm not perfect. See? So what God is saying is that I'm, I didn't just forgive you your past sin. We can't even forgive people their past sin. We can't even get over something that happened 10 years ago, five years ago, 20 years ago, because we're selfish. We're victims, much less forgiving somebody who offends today or who might offend tomorrow. We can't even get over the past. And Jesus is saying, no, I want you to follow my example. I have forgiven you of your past, your present, and all future sin. That means if I get the opportunity or privilege to serve the Lord and live another 30 years, I'm probably going to have a lot more sin. Now, it won't be the type of sin I used to do when I was immature and selfish. It's not going to be those things. But unbelief is a sin. Hardness of heart is a sin. Uh, uh, living in fear is a sin. That's sin. See, the type of sin we commit changes. It's not as blatantly uh, such an abomination to the Lord. 
Now the sin most of us commit is in the heart, in the mind, in the soul, through the emotions, through our decisions, through some of those things. So we have to look at Jesus's example, not their example. I'm not interested in their example because their example is not going to ensure that I stand before God and he says, good and faithful servant and doer of my word. You know what a good and faithful servant is? How do you qualify for good and faithful? There's nothing good in me. There's nothing good in you. How are you faithful? Because we are doers of the word. This is exactly why Jesus came to earth. This is why he needed to live a perfect, sinless, and holy life from offense, unmet expectations, and soul wounds. He didn't have any. When Peter betrayed him, he didn't have any soul wounds. When G Judas got together with the Pharisees to kill him, he didn't have any resentment. Jesus didn't have any of that. That's why he's the name above every name. And we're not even the name above a headache. <laughs> See, we want to be the name above. See, when we follow his example to forgive, it increases the power of the names we're above. If I want to be the name above diabetes, then I have to follow Jesus' example. It costs him, it costs him to become that name, seated on a throne next to God in his rightful place as, an, as a perfect God, as perfect Jesus. But what is it going to cost me? See, I want to get over that. You know, I want to get delivered or healed from that. I want to walk prosperously or in abundance. But you mean it's going to cost me this? Absolutely, it's going to cost you that. Jesus is the example. This is the only example that we follow. This is why he was brutally crucified on a cross. See, all of this are the traits of forgiveness. He literally died to himself, physically, emotionally, spiritually. His father turned his back on him for the sin that you and I committed. This is why Satan did everything to keep him in the grave. Do you know Satan kept to try to keep him in the grave? Do you know that stone that was rolled over his tomb with the ropes and it was roped off was a physical, tangible understanding of what the all hell was trying to do? That was just a physical representation. And then the guards, you know, there's gatekeepers. I've done reels and content on that. You know, the gatekeepers, you know, those two soldiers that were watching the tomb. You know why? Because Satan has gatekeepers. That's who they were. They were watching the gate. They were watching that stone. But guess what? They fell asleep. You know why? Because they were drinking <laughs> unclean spirits. <laughs> so funny, you know, when you read the Bible and you understand these things, because, you know, it's fun. You know, the reading the Bible should be fun. So this is why he was the one that met all requirements God had established in order to give us a free gift of salvation. He's a name above every name. This is why you and I have relationship with God is because of his forgiveness. That's the only reason that we're here today is because he did the right thing. He did the obedient thing and he did the perfect thing. This is the only reason why you and I qualify for healing and deliverance. Let me put it this way, because I like to keep it simple. No forgiveness, no healing, no deliverance. No forgiveness, no breaking curses, no breaking soul ties. No forgiveness, walking in full forgiveness, no success in your Christian walk. No abundance, none of the promises, you don't meet the conditions. That's it, because that is simple. If I make it that simple, then we can all, you know, that we it's easy, easier to understand. But I have to make it simple because the world complicates it. Google complicates it. Kundalini and false doctrine complicated. The word of faith complicated. The new apostolic reformation and all of those people complicated. Religious spirits complicated. Religions complicated. But it's pretty simple because it's all through scripture. So Jesus is our ultimate example. Number two reason why for, uh, forgiveness is difficult is because we are stubborn. We are the exact opposite of Jesus. We're stubborn, we're selfish, we're prideful, and we're one-sided. Remember this because this will serve you well. Forgiveness is difficult because we look at forgiveness through a one-sided lens. The lens is out and the lens says, 
look what you've done to me. What haven't you done for me lately? The lens looks at somebody else instead of looking at self. See, it's easy. It's easy to conjure up a symptom of witchcraft. Every single thing that has ever been done to you. How about this? It's easy to conjure up everything that has not been done for you. That's also unforgiveness. We like to get our big old magnifying glass, don't we? Like this. I like to look at that. One-sided. We look at unforgive or forgiveness as, who wronged us? What have you done to me? And not from the lens of who we have hurt, what we have done. Many of us would say, well, I really haven't done a lot to anybody. But I would beg to differ and say, have you ever hurt God? And then we'd have to go through all that. See, that's why it's difficult. Because when we're trying to forgive, we're looking through this lens. What we should do is turn it around and look this way. That will make it so much easier for us to repent from the sin of unforgiveness. We, we got to look at ourselves, ladies. I know that I do that every day, not introspectively to keep on pins and needles, but here's my prayer. Lord, let my your perfect will in my life be established today. That's how I do it. I don't nitpick myself. I'm not in fear or bondage, wondering what I'm doing or what I'm not doing. I just say, Lord, I commit my day to the Lord and say, Lord, let your perfect will in my life be done. Biblical and acceptable to God forgiveness. Biblical forgiveness and the only acceptable forgiveness requires you and I to forgive that person because we've looked at ourselves and because God has extended us forgiveness, all we do is give back what God has given to us. That's the reason you're going to be healed and delivered. Not so you can be selfish with it, but so that you can give back. Jesus says, freely I have given you forgiveness. Freely now you can go and give. Because he gave you first, you have the opportunity and privilege to give it back. He has given you healing, so you become healed and delivered, so you can go minister healing and deliverance. Every blessing he's given you is not for you. We're not going to hoard the blessings of God. We are going to extend them out. This is how it is easy to forgive, because Jesus already gave you the requirement. He said, freely, I have given you forgiveness, past, today, and tomorrow, so freely, I am requiring you that you go give it back. Everything that God has given us is not for us. Your money is not for you and I and me. Our money, it's not for us. Sure, we can spend some on us, but it's not for us. The income we make is not for us. Everything is dedicated. Everything that is given gets paid out. The reason we have lack and poverty is when we get, we keep. I got a raise. I got a bonus. I'm going to keep it. That's why we're broke. Because we keep these things for ourselves. We're more interested in becoming healed and delivered for ourselves than in interceding and believing for healing on behalf of somebody else, even when we haven't fully received our healing. See? See how we become so selfish? And this is why deliver, uh, forgiveness should be very easy because we are looking at it through the perspective of how God forgave us. When we decide to take a biblical standpoint and perspective on forgiveness by looking at it from the standpoint of who we have hurt and wronged, we become the victor. We are not blaming. We are not expecting we are not requiring them. We're not doing any of that. When we look at it from the perspective of whom we have hurt, before we even got hurt by them, before you were hurt by your ex-husband, 
you probably hurt someone even before that happened, right? That wasn't the first time, probably won't be the last time. When we look at it from the standpoint of who wronged us, we become the victim. Do you wanna be a victor and the name above every name? We'll never be that, but do you wanna be the name above a bunch of names? Or do you wanna be the victim? Full of self-pity. You know what self-pity is? I gave this definition. Hmm. Something in my tooth, part of me. I gave this definition the other day. Self-pity is putting yourself in a pit. It's a self-imposed pit. Self. That's why it's called self-pity. Because you did it to yourself. Self-pity is feeling pity for yourself. It's being a victim because of who's wronged you, who's hurt you, who's betrayed you. Victim or victor? Three signs you are in unforgiveness. Here's the meat of the, here's the meat. Even though we've had a lot of meat, you come to this ministry for meat, we are way done with milk. We're done with milk. Milk is for children. Milk is for baby puppies and baby rabbits and baby kids and babies. We need to be eating the meat and we are chewing on this because your entire freedom depends on what I'm sharing. It just does. And isn't that great that if I could give you one thing to really consider and think about that what if I told you this was literally the key. When Jesus forgave, he took away the keys. See, he forgave you of your sin and he took every key from the enemy. That means when you forgive, you take away every key from the enemy to have you locked up in a self-imposed pit. That's what he did. Well, if he did that, then I should probably do that too. See how easy this is? We don't even have to complicate it. Three signs you are in unforgiveness. Number one, taking offense. You know where that happens? Right here. Taking offense always happens in the mind. You know why? Because offense is a thought. It's not in the soul yet. It's a thought. That's why when we are around people, even today, okay, or when we have been around people and we have felt a spirit of offense, which it can be a demon. If you get offended continually, you actually have a spirit of offense and you need deliverance because you let it get out of hand. I'm offended. I'm offended. I'm offended. That's a spirit. Most things, well, not most, everything. Everything is either your flesh, the enemy, or God and the world, but the enemy rules the world. God's in control. The enemy just has jurisdiction over it. So... Taking offense happens here. Let me prove it. Someone does something and your thought right away, right? Not your emotions, your thought. Can't believe they did that. Then what happens? The soul takes over and starts concocting all of these emotions and feelings. Happen here first. Offense happens in the mind. That's why the Bible says, take your thought captive. You know what take means? aggressively snatch it, snatch it out of your head and see if it lines up with the obedience of God. Three signs you're in unforgiveness, taking offense happens in the mind through a thought. God says, well, take your thought captive. Number two, carrying ought in the soul. What is ought? O-U-G-H-T. Ought is lingering bad feelings or emotions. Where did these emotions? Right here. Lingering bad feelings or emotions because we did not take the thought captive. Number three, holding on to pain in the heart. Three places unforgiveness come from. Taking offense in the mind, carrying ought in the soul, and holding on to pain in the heart. This is why we created this ministry. This ministry is not just about deliverance and healing. This is healing. 
This is healing 101. This is deliverance 101. I wouldn't listen to a teaching on demons until you listen to this teaching first. This type of teaching, whether it's mine or somebody else's, should be the first teaching before anybody ever decides to go through deliverance or expect healing. I believe there are a lot of people let down because they're listening to a bunch of healing and deliverance uh, teachings and they haven't even met the requirement and the conditions. All right, let's talk about ought as most people to include Christians have no idea what ought is. The word ought is spelled O-U-G-H-T. Let's go to Matthew 5, 23 through 24. Speaking from one believer to another, this is a scripture. This is, so we're in the Bible. Matthew is speaking to you and I, not me and the Satan worshiper, not me and my unbelieving uncle. All right. He is speaking to us because he's talking to us as mature believers. So Matthew 5, 23 through 24, I'm going to read it real quickly, but write that down. This is where ought is mentioned. Matthew says, therefore, if any of you decide to bring a gift to the altar. Now, remember, they did that in the Old Testament, right? Before the book of Acts, he was treating them like Jews, right? They were Jews. So that's what they used to do is bring gifts to the altar. So he says, before you bring me a gift to the altar and there remembers that thy brother, that someone that you know has ought, ought, O-U-G-H-T, against you, leave your gift before the altar. Don't even put it down at the altar. It's not worthy yet. Can you imagine? He says, don't even bring your gift to the altar. You know that donation you want to give to Mount Movers tonight? Don't even sow it into Mount Movers. Sure, we, we like the donation. You know what he's saying? Don't even do that yet. Wow. Can you believe that? He says, go your way, first of all, and be reconciled to your brother. Not the same worshiper, not your unbelieving uncle. And be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. God is basically saying, I don't want your money. I want your obedience. I don't want your money. I want your obedience. Now he is saying, if your brother has something against you, now that same spiritual law applies if you have something against your brother, because that's common sense. So basically it would say, therefore, before you bring me any gift to the altar, you know what a gift can be? Praise and worship. How's that? Before you bring me praise and worship, before you read the Bible, and you remember that you have any ought against your fellow brother and sister, Leave your gift, stop your worship, stop your praise, don't go to church, and go and get that reconciled first. And then your gift will be more acceptable. Isn't that why Cain killed Abel? Didn't Abel have a more acceptable gift? Of course, that scenario had nothing to do with unforgiveness, but it had to do with obedience. See, Cain had ought. That's one of the reasons his gift was not acceptable. That's not the main reason. One gift was done in faith and one wasn't. Cain was jealous. Cain was feeling rejected from God. A whole slew of things. The word therefore in that sentence makes Jesus' instructions in this verse a result of what he said in the previous verse. We're not going to read the previous verse. Whenever you see the word therefore, you have to go see what he said before that. He was saying because the consequences of having ought in your heart are so severe, God doesn't want you to do anything until that is handled. Make, make reconciliation. Now, what did I do with Ashley also? A lot of this is repentance. So restitution. So you have to hear from the Holy Spirit because the Lord will tell you how to get it handled. All right, let's keep going. The only ought 
that we are supposed to have. This is godly ought. You saw ungodly ought. Here's godly ought. Let's go to 1 John 4, 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. That's ought used in a different context. But that's the kind of ought we are supposed to have before a holy God. How about this kind of fear and reverent ought? You want to know what fear and reverence looks like with ought? How about this? Romans 12, 1. For by grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. See? But rather think of yourself with sober judgment. in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. When we are holding on to unforgiveness, it's kind of like we're thinking real highly, we're prideful. Well, you don't know what they've done. You know, we have this stubborn, hardness, prideful, kind of serpenty thing going on that kind of dictates when we decide to forgive and how we do it. And he's saying, but rather, girls, ladies, this is New Testament. This was not Matthew that I was reading. This is Romans, which is a masterpiece on God's grace towards us. And he is saying, think of yourself with sober judgment. They won't teach that in a charismatic church. Sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. When we have these three signs of unforgiveness operating in our life, they can show up in many ways. And let me give you some ways that ought, offense, and hurt can show up. We're going to talk about this at the end when we do the exercise, and we're almost done. Ready? So now you know three ways to tell if you are in full, pure, biblical deliverance. Talk about those three ways. Here's how you can tell if you're not, okay? So I gave you the three ways. Now we're gonna talk about some things that you can identify in your relationships with other people to include yourself to see if any of these things are showing up, which are a result of offense, ought, and hurt. Ready? And let me just go back and clarify. Ought are, is lingering negative feelings, and emotions. It means when you see that person, you get this funny feeling, okay? That's what it means. There's this feeling, there's an emotion. It's holding on to a memory. That's what ought does. Ought holds on to memories right here. All right, so here are a few symptoms of those three uh, signs of unforgiveness. Holding on to grudges because you feel rejected, misunderstood, unappreciated, or unheard. So we can hold on to ought because we were misunderstood. We felt rejected. Maybe they didn't give us the response that we wanted. Maybe they didn't understand us. Maybe we were expecting something from them and we have these unmet expectations. I know I've done that with my husband. I have to watch that. I'll tell him these wonderful things and you know what he'll say? Oh, okay, that's nice. And I'm like, I want more than that. Come on. <laughs> so these are uh, little tiny things, but be careful. Be careful because the enemy will get you to take an offense. Didn't he hear me? Didn't he understand? Why isn't he asking questions? Doesn't he care what I'm going through? That used to be my offense with Ryan. Doesn't he care what I'm going through? I'm in this spiritual battle and I'm here alone and he's on the road and he doesn't even ask me how my day is. Been there. Been there. All right. Lingering bad feelings known as ought. Keeping the memory attached to your soul. We covered that. And when it attaches, when that memory stays attached to your soul, it fragments the soul. So what a fragmented soul means is that that memory, what that person does, because we're not taking our thoughts captive, 
we're not guarding our heart, etc. When that uh, continues to repeat, it's like a refracture in the soul. It's like your soul's trying to become healed and you're trying to become de delivered, but the ought continues to refracture and rebreak your soul. So your soul starts to fragment into a multitude of pieces and it's like Humpty Dumpty putting everything back again. That's a fragmented soul. I'll do a teaching on it. Uh, number three or four, speaking or thinking negatively about that person. Speaking or thinking negatively. Negatively doesn't mean I hate them, they're this. Negatively can be a repetitive over and over of what they've done to you without a point for sharing that information. A lot of times I'll share with you, but it's for a point of teaching and for content. But if you're rehashing with your family, do you know what she had, she did? And this makes no sense to me. And you go tell your sister and your brother and your aunt and your uncle, and you're swirling in this stuff. You have unforgiveness. You have ought. That's between you, God, and the other person. That's between you, God, and the other person. Your brother and sister don't have to know everything. Your best friend doesn't have to know everything. Now, you can be an open book with your sisters. We do that here at Mount Movers. Check the heart motive. Why are you sharing what you're sharing? Are you sharing this because you're hurt and you want sympathy and empathy? Or are you sharing for a reason that God can get behind? Why are you sharing what you're sharing about who you're sharing it about? Is it to get people on your side? Is it because you want to give people an impression about you so they don't take the wrong impression? See, there are some unhealthy reasons why we do what we do. Slander and gossip, another way to tell if you are operating in those three things. Continuing to take offense over and over again. Unresolved hurt. Blaming or blame shifting. Trying to make yourself look better. In other words, explaining yourself. Explaining yourself. Over-presenting yourself. Over-exaggerating yourself so you look a certain way in that situation to make sure who you're telling knows that it was not you. How about anger? Bitterness, resentment. How about entitlement, such as payback, which can include punishment, which can include things like setting up godly, ungodly, ungodly boundaries that act to punish or avoid the person out of a wrong heart. We are, God never told us to put up bound or to put up walls or to punish. That's not His instruction in the Bible. This is what it looks like. Well, I'm never talking to him again. I'm cutting him out of my life. You give him the cold shoulder. Those are some ways to see if you are acting out of ought, offense, and hurt. Let me give you a truth bomb that we need to tattoo on our arm regarding forgiveness. Okay, here's a truth bomb. God has allowed us to put up boundaries, not walls. God has allowed us to build up boundaries, not walls. God has allowed us to set up boundaries, not walls. We can't love somebody through a wall. We can't have compassion for the other person through a wall. Only through setting up boundaries will the Lord actually allow us to see what's going on with them. So we are moved with compassion so that we can forgive more easily. The Bible tells us to guard our heart with all diligence. It doesn't say to set a wall around your heart. There are healthy ways to healthily uh, avoid people until you're healed and delivered enough uh, in a godly way, not a self-righteous way, not a prideful way, not a stubborn way. There are healthy, godly ways that you can set boundaries up for a time and a season until the Lord gives you further instruction. 
This doesn't mean that you, uh, when you forgive somebody that you have any type, you have to have a type of relationship with them, but it means you need to still, you are, you are, you are required to give them unconditional and full uh, forgiveness the way the Lord has given you. All right, last section. I want to give you some things to consider, and then we're going to go to the exercise regarding uh, forgiveness, and then we're going to jump into the exercise. All right. Number one, you have to understand what true godly forgiveness is. It's not all of those other things we saw, plus some other things I'm going to show you. Uh, godly forgiveness unconditionally given to somebody is a choice. It is godly. It is intentional. And it is an obedient free will choice and decision that God requires of you and I as his children because he practices what he preaches. He gives it so he expects it. Having any type of unforgiveness is total willful disobedience and it is sin. See, what really is the, the issue is that most of us don't understand unforgiveness as a sin. We understand it as a choice that we may or may not make depending on the circumstances. So the enemy gives us a bunch of circumstances. Well, you don't know what they've done and how severe it was and what I had to put up with. And you can listen to those thoughts and they'll take you straight to hell. And they will keep you from becoming healed and delivered. Godly and biblical deliverance is a sin or, uh, or is a choice. Godly forgiveness is a choice. Unforgiveness is a sin. One is a decision to be obedient. The other is a choice to be disobedient. Full forgiveness lets go of permanently. Permanently. Doesn't bring it up again. Doesn't rehash it. How that person wronged you. When we do this, we open up every opportunity to be fully healed and delivered. This is why Jesus forgave us. Every time before he would heal somebody, he says, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. You can only have peace. Jesus did this almost every time he healed somebody. He linked forgiveness of sin to healing and deliverance. I could give you too many examples. I don't have time. Because he's telling you that forgiveness of sin to include our sin is what gave us the privilege to be healed and delivered. Now we have that privilege from the Lord, but we can, and we can come under the blessing or we can not extend it to others. And we come under a curse. When you choose to commit the sin of unforgiveness, you are under a curse and not a blessing and you will not receive healing and deliverance. Number two, you have to understand what forgiveness is not. And you will find out everything deliverance is not, or uh, uh, forgiveness, excuse me, when you go to Google. You want to know what forgiveness is not? Go to Google. Because you're going to see everything uh, that true biblical forgiveness, that they want They want you to buy that. They want to seduce you into that. They want to take, they want your soul. You know, we see these cute books. Let me go and show you the, the I showed you already a book, but let me show you the, the same book. Let me show you this book real quickly. We already saw it, but let me just show it to you again. You, you can take forever. You can take a long time. You can make forgiveness a journey, but you know what? It's going to take you straight to hell. If I were the devil, that's what I would do. I'd convince you deliverance is a journey. Forgiveness, the passionate journey. Ooh, doesn't this sound even better? And this is the upper room. There's so much kundalini in this. I'm not even going to go here.
Here is what forgiveness is not. I liked this. Read this. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Jesus is the only one who has the perfect ability to not forget. He says he will never remember our sins from the east to the west. Every sin we have um, committed, Jesus forgets. He doesn't hold them to our account. For us who are in the flesh that have a soul and are here on this earth, forgiveness does not mean we forget. Forgiveness is not denying the hurt. Take a picture of this so you can understand because healing is your journey, not forgiveness. Forgiveness is a choice. Healing is a journey. Write that down. Forgiveness is your obedient decision before God. And then healing becomes the byproduct. Healing becomes the byproduct. Forgiveness is not denying the hurt. It's not the same as reconciliation. It's not circumventing God's justice. Read these. It's not excusing wrong behavior. It's not waiting for time to heal all wounds. Forgiveness is not letting the guilty off the hook. Read these. Aren't these great? I'm not going to read them. I'll take a picture. Because I don't want you to. This is the healing portion of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a choice. And then that choice leads you into healing and deliverance. So that eventually one of these days, all of these things can be dealt with. So take a picture. I'm going to go ahead and move on. Number three, realize that your decision not to forgive has ultimate power and authority to kill, steal, and destroy the very life of the very life you desire, which can include your deliverance and healing, meeting the right type of person. Do you know why people end up with familiar spirits? Do you know why they end up in three narcissistic relationships? because they didn't forgive. They have too much unresolved offense, hurt, and ought. You know why hurt people end up in continue, other relationships that continue to hurt them? Because they are operating out of unforgiveness. What does hurt have to do with unforgiveness? It's unresolved. It's unresolved. And these things attach themselves to our soul and make it very, very difficult to move on into the future God has for us. So unforgiveness will keep you from meeting the right person, the right husband, from having godly relationships or having a healthy relationship and a bountiful relationship with the Lord. What happens is you continue to relive these incidents over and over again, and you give it the power it needs to attach to every aspect of your life. Then we develop prejudices towards people. Remember my friend Donna who ended up becoming a homosexual? She developed prejudices. She said, well, I guess all men will hurt me. I don't need a man. Maybe there's something safer in a female relationship. We become judgmental. We become critical. We become cynical and less trusting like my friend Donna. We can isolate ourselves from things that can help us and we can begin to stereotype. That's what my friend Donna did. Someone convinced her that all men are going to hurt her. So she created this ungodly stereotype. <laughs>